for intro. You've now tuned in to the Drawing Board Podcast, a powerful, thought-provoking discussion where we talk about family, relationships, ministry, community, and career. Let's see what exciting guests we have on our show today. Welcome to the Drawing Board Podcast. This is the founder and host, Andre Ebron. I'd like to say to everyone that has been tuning in over this year, thank you and God bless you for supporting our podcast. And to every visitor, every guest that has come on the show, I extend a lot of thanks, a lot of prayer, and a lot of gratitude for you lending your time, your resource, and the quality information that you share with our listeners every single week. And so this week is our Thanksgiving edition. So I, I decided to invite some of my friends on uh, to the podcast. And so today, I tell you all, I always have excellent and exciting guests, and tonight is no different. Tonight, I have the Reverend. <laughs> no, the Reverend Doctor. No, I'm no, complaining. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. But no. <laughs> I do have uh, my good friend and his lovely bride, his wife, uh, Pastor Torian and Lady J, better known as Lady J, but Lady Jasmine Bridges. Please let's welcome them to the to the drawing board podcast. That's when the crowd goes wild. All right, here we go. All right. And so tonight um, is a great time where we're just going to offer thanks to God and talk about a lot of things that I know will minister to you tonight. And we're going to call this segment Beauty for Ashes, right? So the scripture says in Isaiah 61, verse 3, it says that he'll give you beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. And I believe that the testimony of the Bridges family definitely reflects that whatever it is that you've lost, that God will restore. Uh, and he won't just restore it back to the former state, but he'll do it in a greater way, in a greater magnitude. He'll amplify his blessings on your life. There. So when people look at you, they will say, God has definitely blessed you. So let me welcome my guests here tonight. Welcome, Pastor and Lady J. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here today. It's always good hanging with you, Dre. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Tonight is uh, Minister Ebron. Uh, oh, you know, okay. no, Excuse yeah. me. No. <laughs> <laughs> so the joke, inside joke is I said there are three people that live in this body. There's Minister Ebron, there's Andre Ebron, and then it's this dude named Dre. So that's where you get the joke from, all right? But tonight, 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 um, I know last Thursday, um, last Thursday marks six years uh, since you all had what was a tragedy and now it's turned triumph. Uh, let's talk about it. What what happened six years ago? Yep, so six years ago, um, it's funny, we had had a pretty busy week um, of ripping and running from this event to that event. And that particular Thursday, just a week before Thanksgiving, six years ago, we had decided maybe we should stay home today and stay, you know, Skip skip out on work and stay home because we were just that exhausted. And we hadn't had much time. This was way before kids. All, our only baby was our dog, Brody. He was a Maltese. So we said, maybe we'll just stay home today and spend time with Brody. Um, but we said, no, no, no. We, 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 I think we end up going to work late. And, but eventually we, we end up deciding to go. Um, and shortly thereafter, we got a call from a neighbor. He said, hey. Are you guys barbecuing? And uh, we explained, no, we're at work. He says, well, there's flames and smoke coming from your house. I think you need to get home. Now that I think about it, what kind of, like, barbecue could that be <laughs> that he would have seen flames and smoke from his house? That's just. <laughs> yeah, yeah if, you, if you think about it, what kind of call <laughs> is that? Like, uh, hey, you know. Can I have some Can ribs? Can I have some ribs? Can I get you some know? of those ribs uh, that you're grilling? Can you have some rib tips or what's, what what's kind going of, on? Yeah. yeah. All right. So by the time we uh, we actually carpooled that uh, that day, our buildings wasn't very far from each other out in Southfield. Um, so by the time one of his coworkers brought him over to my job, and by the time we got home, um, there was really nothing left. Um I remember um, it was it was very devastating because you know we didn't care about the material things the the things in the home um, the actual frame of the home all we cared about was our dog Brody um, and I remember Torian running in as cops and uh, you know fire department 
was surrounded our home. Uh, I remember him trying to run in, you know, to see if Bailey, I mean, excuse me, Brody um, was okay. And of course, unfortunately, you know, uh, we lost him tragically. Um, but the interesting thing is after, after um, that fire, a few days later, we were able to enter the home. When we first moved into the house, uh, we moved in a week, the week of our wedding. Um, and I remember his grandmother, who's Catholic, gave us a cross. Mm-hmm. Um by you gonna, the, are you gonna close already? You, you gonna, oh, you okay. I'm sorry. Am I, am you, I speaking? You, you, you telling close, the story too no, fast? No, go ahead and close now. You already <laughs> up there? Yeah, she she getting ready to close. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> no, that's good. So she gave you a cross. So she gave us a cross shortly after we moved into the home, and um, of course, by this point, we've already removed um, Brody's body from the house, and we ultimately had him cremated. Um, but at this point because of all the soot and everything else that was in the house, we had hardwood floors in the home. There was an outline. Have you ever seen a show like A Law and Order? You've seen, you know, where uh, someone's body had been perhaps before, you know, once they remove it out of a home or wherever um, they lost their lives. So it was a situation like that where soot was all over the floor, but of course there was this outline of Brody's body. But close to his body... Out of all the shuffle and everything that was lost, uh, the cross. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we we often joke now that even a dog knows to, when run, it, to, the to run to the cross. Absolutely. And so uh, it was, but, you know, th- that was, uh, you know, the, bl- the blessing in it. Of course, it was hard to see the blessing in it at the time. It was very devastating, but... Um, you know, now six years later, six years we later. see the purpose and all the things. Um, it, w- it was meant what was meant to be. Absolutely. And so in that moment, because what we're talking about in less than five minutes, a five minute statement, there were emotions that you had to cipher and filter through. There were you had to rebuild everything that you all had invested. You all were newlyweds. Yes. And so, because I know what it was. I heard the story. You're trying to, you know, taper it off, you know, for uh, the podcast. <laughs> like, we just decided to go into work late. That's newlywed talk. Yeah, yeah. that is new. Yeah, Pastor. No, that was. Pastor, no, that was. No, no Pastor, that was, see, you Pastor, keep, keep Pastor it, and Lady keep, J, listen, he listen. He keeping it real. Yeah, he keeping it, the G rated. Yeah, but absolutely. No, I so. mean, that week was a, um, the seven day before that, the full seven days before that was extremely tiresome. And I think we had decided that night that we had not been home much and we needed to spend time with our dog. I mean, who I mean, who takes off work to spend time? I mean, that was our legitimate reason to spend time with our dog. Um, the Christmas tree was up. Um, gifts were wrapped underneath that tree. And we just had not spent time at home. And, um, you know... Even six years later, that's still very, um, it's it's villa, still a very fresh feeling when that day comes on. There's certain stuff that, certain days that happen. Um, you know, you get triggered by a loved one's birthday that's no longer here. So, you know, you get sad around that day. The hymnist wrote that time is is filled with swift transitions and the you know the old folks used to say just keep on living and you'll really get what it is that means mm-hmm. and the six years since then you know has been that day in a nutshell was like watching the movie Steel Magnolias. I'm not sure if you ever watched the movie Steel Magnolias. With, yeah. And I'm not talking about the remake. I'm talking about the original with, with Julia Roberts, Sally Field. Um, not Blanche from Golden Girls, but one of them that looked like Blanche. What's the woman that we watched that documentary on the other day? Dolly Parton. All of them was in the movie. And that movie held every single human emotion in that film. From the beginning to the end. And I remember that day saying, no, we're not going to do that. I remember being at work and just having peace surround me before that phone call. And I remember the havoc that 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 
happened. I remember seeing our friends' faces. I remember, I mean, the entire wedding party, all those that were local, stood outside that house as it burned. And you're talking about people that worked in Auburn Hills, and it was just in a matter of moments once they found out that that house was on fire, that their house was on fire, because it wasn't our, it was their house. That house belonged to Shauna, to Paige, to Bull, to Marcus, to, you know, every, I mean, that was their house. And I just remember everybody being there. I remember seeing Shan weeping. And you would have thought, you know, we would have been there crying. I mean, you saw the real emotion from people that were attached to that house. You saw Paige. I remember Paige pulling up. And I remember saying, you know, you had that actual, like, talk with somebody before. Like, listen, we can't have that crying stuff right now. Right. You got to be strong because we got to be strong. And so... I just remember that emotion, but and I remember that night, Andre. We lost everything. Right. But that night, that night was a party. I mean, you didn't know what we was gonna do tomorrow. We knew we was not going to work the next day. And I remember being in my in-laws' basement. I remember Shan being there. And this is before I was a pastor. Help me. But you know, this was. I mean, we had a good time that night. Right. And so um, when we put the Christmas tree up this week, this you know, the weekend before. Um, it was, we had, you know, the Christmas tree had burned down, so we had to go buy, I mean, we literally went to Big Lots, bought the Christmas tree with smoke-smelling clothes. We went back on Thanksgiving to that same Big Lots, and that cashier saying, I remember y'all. Wasn't y'all just in here the other day? Didn't you just buy this tree? And I had to tell her, and I want to say they gave us that tree for like half off. Like half, it was something crazy. Right. You know, but, you know, that th- that time, um, you know, you never understand a storm while you're in it. You know, you never understand. You know, you always have these woe is me moments while you're in it, and then you exit out of it, and you'd be like, okay, God, I can see that. But that time, you're like, eh, mm, you can have all, all this. Right. All this. And there's been times after that, but that has always set the the mark for what I can take and what we can take. Man, if you lose everything, you ain't got nothing else. Yeah, I mean, all we had was each other. Yeah. I mean I mean what that that was I mean it was literally, you know, like the O three Bonnie and Clive, you know, like you know, well, well I don't know what he say after that because I don't listen to the song <laughs> right. that much. But yeah. but you know that was I mean that was it. When you literally have nothing. Right. When I tell you on our backs, let's say. everything was gone, like my aunt was so creeped out because she walked into the house and saw that our guide kids and our niece's Christmas gifts were wrapped. And, and to see that be burnt into, you know, be partially burnt or filled, whatever, like that was like phenomenal. And so now... Just about everything I can look at and be like, eh, you know, I can use that as a level of what can be uh, accomplished. And that's one of those times where you look at like, no, I can really do all things through Christ. That strengthens me. Because when you don't have that nice watch, those nice clothes, those nice shoes, that nice jacket, you know. I think there was a situation to where... Jasmine and my mother-in-law had bought the same coat, but Jasmine took my mother-in-law's coat with her. And so Jasmine had a brand new coat because the coat she bought was with my mother. You know what I mean? And right. then it was a mix-up. It was a mix-up. It ended up being a blessing. Cause yeah. Cause I didn't, you know, that day to work, all I had on was like a, you know, a, a little fleece jacket. I didn't have a real winter coat on that day. Right. And um, thank God we had, you know, you know, end up, being a you know a bad situation for my mom, you know she <laughs> lost the coat, but you know end up yeah. you know blessing me that I end up having a coat for that that winter season. Right, it was just you know what my God's plan. Right, that's yeah, that's God's plan. Uh, praise God that my coat is still at your house. Uh, unfortunately, you know, yeah. But here's the here's the thing that I, I love about the story. So I'm glad that we took time to actually discuss like the tragedy, right? Because sometimes people want to just 
fast forward and run through it and get to the, and praise God, now we are, you know, and we're going to definitely get to that part because God doesn't leave you in tragedy, right? Right. But even amidst the tragedy, because of your service and your love for your friends, that what happens to you also greatly impacts them, right? <laughs> and they show up, and they show up in grand number, and they weep with those that are weeping. Oh, they yeah, they mourn was... with those that are mourning. They rejoice with those that are rejoicing. And so what I love about uh, what you were sharing is that your attitude, even amidst the trial or the tragedy, was still, hey, listen, we're going to celebrate. Uh, we're going to celebrate even though we just lost everything. We're going to enjoy the company that we have. I think that's an innate ability amongst folks that look like us. To be resilient. I, I think that is, I mean, you see it on, on what's that show, uh, Good Times, how they always had everybody over. I think that's one of the characteristics. I have a pastor friend that lives in Vegas, and he says nobody is from Vegas there. People okay. are from everywhere else. And he says, nobody, and so he was with us in May, and so I went over uh, <laughs> Stevie's house, and there was a whole, like, uh, there was a whole lot of us, and he was just shocked that you have all of these people coming to each other's houses, he says, because out there, they don't do that. There's no sense of, like, community. community. And I think amongst us, uses. Right. That there's this innate ability, and you see it when somebody dies, that somebody brings pop, somebody brings a pound cake, somebody brings a casserole, and... Don't forget the plates and cups. Somebody brings the plates and cups <laughs> primarily just to make sure that they're able to grab some on the way out. Absolutely. Um, one of, one of uh, Jasmine's mentors passed a few weeks ago. My condolences. And um, on a Thursday night, there was a dinner with the actual family, and we were able to go to that. And, Andre, when I tell you there was so much food, I mean, you would have thought 15 supermarkets was, like, going out of business. And it all it had to be all of, like, 18 folks. And they was like, well, y'all can have eighths if you want to. Like, you're past, like, first place, second place. They was like, take some home. Right. You know, but I think that's – the innate ability amongst black folks. Yeah. That no matter what it is, what's happening, this, that, and the third, we, we don't celebrate. know what to do, we're but going, we still gonna celebrate. Are we gonna celebrate? Mm -hmm. I love when you quote the scripture, um, you know, I can do all things mm -hmm. through Christ which strengthens me, right? And so everybody's quotes Philippians 4, you know, uh 13, then they'll skip some scriptures, Philippians 4, 16, but my God shall supply. So all of those scriptures prior to that, Paul walks his journey down. He mm -hmm. says, I know what it is to be, uh, you up know, high. up high. I know what mm -hmm. it is to be abased. I know what it is to be full. I know what it is to be hungry. So he goes through this uh, contrast of, you know, this contrast of ha having abundance, experiencing lack, mm -hmm. uh, being sitting on the Sanhedrin council to being rejected and thrown out of cities. Mm -hmm. And then he gets to verse 13 and says, But I can do. But I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. So we see that happening here. Now let's go ahead and take a journey moving forward. So six years in, um, you guys are married, standing strong together. Uh, you get some news that uh, you have ovarian cancer. This is a year after yes. a year the after house, the house mm -hmm. fire. So we... Um, Few a few months after losing everything, um, you know, it took us a few months to start, you know, preparing ourselves to purchase a new home. And uh, once we finally get into our new home, of course, we were happy. You know, we everything is looking good. And um, I towards the end of that next year, I started, you know, you know, doing my normal um, appointments, you know, to the doctor and. Um, uh, you know, I've had some very thorough doctors who, um, basically, in a nutshell, um, after going to several appointments and, you know, trying out this doctor and the next, basically uncovered um, I had ovarian cancer. Um, and I, I'm thankful for my team of doctors um, then. And, you know, of course, I, I have these same doctors now, but they're some of the best because for many years, I couldn't understand why I couldn't lose weight. I couldn't understand, um, you know, just a, a, 
a lot of things that were happening in, in my body. I just didn't understand it. And, and people kept blowing me off. Doctors kept blowing me off for quite some time. And um, finally, when I went to this team of doctors I have now, they said, okay, let's start looking into this. Let's start digging. My OBGYN so much so, uh, my first time going to her, you know, usually when you go to a doctor, of course, they have you to fill out all that paperwork and ask you about your family history. Right. Um, and then the next thing they do is bring you in a room and examine you. Before this woman ever examined me, she had me in her office, and we probably met for a good 45 minutes to an hour just going over my history. Um, and, I mean, you know, I was sharing with her how the month prior, that October, um, I went to a primary doctor who believed I had PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome. Okay. That's what I thought. And usually that causes infertility and basically means that women have a lot of little small cysts surrounding their ovaries. And it also um, causes weight gain and really prevents you really from losing weight. So that's why they thought maybe I had that. So that was October. Fast forward to November, um, I met with the OB. Um, and she said, well, let's confirm that you have PCOS. They can do that via a transvaginal ultrasound. Okay. Um, and they did that. But, of course, when they did that, they didn't see a bunch of cysts. They seen a tumor on my left ovary. And um, she says, well, you know, we don't know if this is malignant or benign. And so she says, the next step is for you to go and have uh, MRI done. Um, we, we can't tell in the office. And so that... Um, New Year's Eve, I'll never forget it. I went to Sinai Grace to have an uh, MRI done. Fast forward, now we're into January. I, the results from the MRI is now back with my doctor. She has me to come in. She says, Jasmine, I keep rereading and looking over this report from the MRI text. Usually, they're able to de usually we're able to determine what kind of tumor, meaning if it's malignant or benign, it is based off their report. She says, I'm not able to. She says, let's reconvene. I left her office that day not really knowing um, what to expect. And probably the following Friday, I never forget this call either, I got a call from my OBGYN personally. She says, Jasmine, this has literally kept me up at night. I keep rereading this report. I keep looking at the pictures. She says, but basically what the MRI techs are trying to tell us is that whatever kind of tumor it is, it has taken over your entire left ovary. I can't tell you what to do. My suggestion is that we go in <coughs> and, do a and do a surgery. At this point, I was 25 years old. We did not have kids. I um, never had surgery. And so my initial <laughs> thought was, and I basically said this to her, I've never had surgery and I don't plan on it. All right. And, um, of course, you know, I shared this with my mom. I'm my only child. My mom, you know, in the back of her mind, she don't want to see her child hurt. So she's like, well, you know, don't do it. You know, she never quite said it, but that's kind of how she was beating around the bush with it. You know, she didn't want to see me have to go through a surgery. Right. But this guy over here, my husband, was like, no, you're going to have surgery. So, you know, I kept going back and forth for a couple of weeks. I know I'm not going to do it. Okay, I'll do it. And he was like, no. He put his foot down and said, no, you're going to have this surgery, he says, because ultimately I don't want a situation where the doctors tell me I'm going to lose my wife because she didn't have a preventative surgery. Well, hold so, on, hold on, because what we know about ovarian cancer is this. 90, and I may be quoting it as the high percentage here just for, like, shock value, and I'll throw that disclaimer out. Most of the cases that I've ever heard of it mm -hmm. is you always hear about it at somebody's funeral. Okay. Barack Obama's mother had it, and typically it's one of those cancers that by the time you find out, it, it, there's nothing else that can be done about it. And so knowing that and being a random guy that likes a lot of random like things like that, like reading random stuff, facts, facts like facts, that, right. like I was like, and eh, yeah, no, this isn't something we're going to pay with because if they're able to see it now, you know, God knows what else is hiding behind those things. So, you know, I was like, I don't care what your mom and them say. You going. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, because you you wanted to be able to enjoy this life with your wife. Exactly. I understand. Look, look at you smile. I saw, I saw that smile. Yeah. Look, did, Bishop, did you see? Bishop. Oh, yeah. Here no. Go. Here. no. Pastor, did you see that yeah. smile on him? I mean, because yeah. that was something that for me, coming out of the, I mean, like, and I don't want to sound patriarchal, but she was the only asset that I had. Mm-hmm. I got what you're saying. There wasn't any book. I mean, there wasn't any books. There wasn't any TVs. There wasn't any art. There wasn't any all this stuff that we collect TVs, DVDs, and PS4s and all. There wasn't anything. So now I'm out of that. Right. You know, I'm out of that and started to uh, accumulate that stuff again just now to see, okay, I got the stuff back. But now to have the uh, the attack move on to her. Right. So for me, it got really personal. And it wasn't about what you're not going to do. It was about this is what we have to do. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes. Now, so- now, granted, there's a lot of things that I did not understand and that I don't, I don't still understand even today mm-hmm. about how emotionally that could have been for her. Um, but I knew... From a selfish point of view, what I what wasn't going to happen was a year after that I wasn't going to lose her. After losing the house, the dog, you know, Andre knows, you know, and you know, but that was not, I mean, I keep emphasizing that because that's a I mean, for me, like even still, that rings true. There was nothing like Jeezy has this song. I used to have. Nothing. Now I got a whole lot of everything. That's how I feel now. Right. Like nothing. Like yeah, you, you're not exaggerating. Like, I'm, you there's say no exaggeration. You, exaggerate. mean, you like, mean literally, literally? There was literally, literally nothing. nothing. So there's sometimes when people say, uh, you know, started from the bottom, and they didn't really start from the bottom. Yeah. Right. You know, you no. Know, but when you talk about like baseline, we have nothing. You're everything talking about built, pulling your own bootstraps up, pulling yourself from your own bootstraps and you have no boots, nothing. Nothing. Yeah, like, absolutely. Like, we had to go buy new undergarments. Right. Like, a toothbrush. I mean, on the basic level, on a toothbrush. A to- and, and you're so incoherent to all of that stuff. I right. remember being in Walmart with Matthew and Bull and someone. I can't remember. It could have been someone else, but it could have just been them. And we and I didn't even have any money on me because some of the money got burnt up. Right. And they paid for that stuff. So, you know, when I tell you, like, there was a rallying around, and there always has been. Right. You know, even today in our church, I mean, you know, most of those people that's in leadership was the ones that was at that house when that house burned down. Absolutely. So they've stood with you through it all. So uh, you get the report. You have the surgery. Yep. Um so she um, she went ahead and said, well, we're going to do the surgery. So February, um, I believe it was the 21st, um, they went in for the first surgery. Of course, they don't know. With ovarian cancer, unfortunately, there's no um, test to detect this. That's why he was mentioning, for the most part, most people find out when they're on their way out, unfortunately. Um, so, of course, when they got in, my OBGYN, uh, performed the procedure when they got in they knew immediately that it was cancer um, and they called in a gynecologic oncologist in but what he said was she's been under the knife too long uh, we don't want to concern her family let's go ahead and close her up mm-hmm. all I remember um, upon waking up when I woke up from surgery I remember a team of nurses surrounded that hospital bed. I mean, going a mile a minute asking me, what's your family history with cancer? Cancer this, cancer that. I immediately knew upon waking up I had cancer just based off that experience. That experience alone was, I mean, I, I, it's still really hard for me to even put in words how I felt during that time. Imagine going under a knife, not knowing where you going, not knowing what they would find, and just waking up surrounded by bright lights and a team of folks in white garments. Um, and so that was just traumatizing in itself. Right. Um, but I recall, um, you know, maybe the next day 
or maybe even that same night, the gynecologic oncologist who were brought who was brought in to the surgery coming by my hospital room and he said, Miss Bridges, um, I'm gonna let you heal up for two weeks. But in two weeks we're gonna go back in and um remove the rest of the tumor. So what they ended up doing, what my OBGYN did in that initial surgery is she removed the tumor from my ovary but left a small piece of my left ovary intact. Okay. Um, and, and the thought process behind that was even with just a small piece of your ovary, you can still conceive. Right. Um, so anyway, I, from that point, I met with the oncologist and met with him in his office, and we um, had – several hours of just talking to him about what to expect with this upcoming second now sec, second surgery he was getting ready to perform and he's you know pretty he's a pretty radical guy and he basically <laughs> said and that's putting it nicely right he basically said he wanted to you know do a full hysterectomy because he's just that radical but you know given that he has spoken with my OBGYN and given that he spoke with us and, and we, he knew we were younger, we did not have kids, we had a desire to have kids, he said, okay, I'm not going to be as radical. Um, but fast forward, we go to the second surgery, March 9th. Mm -hmm. What he did remove was the rest of that left ovary, my omentum, which is like the fatty tissue that covers your stomach, 18 lipnoids, and my appendix. And typically, the reason why he removed that those items is typically with ovarian cancer, after it moves from your ovary to your tubes, it usually goes to your stomach, So, which is why he removed the omentum and then my appendix to all of that in that same area. Okay. Um, so I celebrate uh, February 21st, both dates really, February 21st and March 9th every year as my cancer anniversary, um, as I, I call it. So this coming February will be my fifth year cancer anniversary, which is something huge because the the rate, um, as we mentioned before, mortality rate is high. It's the number one deadliest gynecologic cancer there is, and the success rate of a, even a five year survival rate is is very low um, I don't know the number off hand but it, I'm I'm a walking test testimony and I'm, I, I know that I'm blessed and I, I'm again thankful for the, those doctors that I had that was willing to go the extra mile willing to um, fight against my insurance company that didn't want to pay for that transvaginal ultrasound mm -hmm. that saw that tumor in the first place Right, so you're a leave, living, breathing, walking, talking, moving miracle. Yes. And uh, throughout the odds, the course, the theme for tonight is Beauty for Ashes, is that even you having to go through that surgery at 25, uh, even though you prior the prior year you had lost everything that you had built, you were still married to this handsome guy who was willing to stand with you <coughs> and to stand for you. Yes. Uh, that God put you in the midst of those that would advocate on your behalf so that you can have the best doctors necessary in order to achieve the goal. Then you all stood in faith, believing that you all would conceive yes. and uh, probably had some more of those days where you were late to work, you know, <laughs> and... Uh, so Who knew? Be, this yes, be a family. Yeah, it is a family. <laughs> That's why it's PG. Listen, so you guys were a little, thirteen. Yeah, PG thirteen. Well, you know, no, no, you don't have to be thirteen. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be thirteen. So listen, listen and God has blessed you all with two beautiful children: a handsome son named Hunter and a beautiful daughter named Hannah. Yes. So this is for those that are listening uh, out there: is that God can take what looks impossible. You can travel through so much in life where you lose everything that you've built. And then did you hear them say that God gave them a brand new home? They were vigilant and looking, that he blessed them. And even after they got in the home and got it all looking good, they got some news that affected now the core of the family, the health of the family. And there was a threat that they wouldn't be able to conceive children, but God did it anyways. They have two children now. So you get a chance to see here comes the beauty now. For ashes. And the next scripture say he'll give you the oil of joy for mourning. Of course there was some mourning. Us being believers, us, you know, having faith, us, you know, ministering and serving others doesn't keep us from mourning when we lose things. <coughs> but now we're in the beauty side. We are, God is restoring. He's bringing restitution. He's bringing restoration. 
and let's talk about it. So from your search for your new home, you discovered you had a passion for real estate. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, of course, not many of us, um, us being folks that look like you and I, okay. um, we, we're not educated on the subject. We're not educated on the subject of having our credit in place. Um, and so it was during that time I realized, you know, I wasn't necessarily in a place or we wasn't necessarily in a place ready to buy a second, now second home. Uh, you know, we need a savings. You need money for that, right, to yeah. buy a home. Um, you know, so we had to get our, our our ducks in a row, as they say. We had to do some saving um, and, you know, and minimize some of our debt. You know, we were college students, so we had student loans. So we had to start, you know, calling them up and say, hey, can you give me a, a mortgage forbearance? Um, so we kind of really was just walking that process and lear- as we were walking that process ourselves, we were learning um, and hope to help educate and what I found later to help educate others on the process as well. Um, during that period, I spent plenty of days um, just looking up the real estate market, um, you know, learning some of the trends. Uh, was it a buyer's market or a seller's market? Um, and how that impacted us now as buyers. So I, I you know, I guess I developed a love for uh, real estate during that time. And I I did not know that I would ever become a realtor um, at that period, but six years in, uh, now I am, and um, I'm going, you know, now into my second year of real estate. During my first year, I did over a million dollars in sales. Congratulations. um, That is way. Yeah, okay. (laughs) Yeah, and so um, you know, with no, no, literally no background, um, little money to put up front to, to do it. But again, um, you know, I realized that all of our steps are just order, and so um, I, I had not shared this actually with very many people. Very few people knew this, but um, I had gotten licensed, um, I believe, January of seventeen. Believe it was, no, believe. No, it was after that. Oh, eighteen. Yeah. So maybe January of two thousand eighteen, but I didn't have the time really to focus on um, on it because I was working full time in human resources where my background is in. I didn't have the time to focus on my my real estate license uh, because it takes time. Uh, long story short, that few months later, that April, I was laid off from my job. Okay. <clears throat> Most people did not know that. Um, I was laid off, but it was almost like a blessing. Mm-hmm. I was laid off, and it was really no, no missing, no missing beat. I just went from one <laughs> career almost to another career. Um, at that point, because I was laid off, I had all the time in the world, of course. I was able to go to my uh, real estate broker's office, learn from some of the best. I was able to take some training classes. And because of that drive and that will that some of those senior agents saw in myself, guess what they started doing? They started throwing me business. And so that's actually some of my first deals that I closed was from some of these senior agents who simply just didn't have time to handle their workload. And they said, Jasmine, go and show this house for me. Can you hold an open house? And they would pay me to do that. And that's when I, you know, started developing my craft. And from there, it just it just took off. I remember one of, um, one of my very first deals was I realized on my street a home had become vacant. Of course, I did my research and contacted um, the owner of that home. He did not live locally. Um, I contacted him and said, hey, I realize your house is vacant. You know, do you need help? I'm a, a realtor. I know the market. I, I really didn't, but I sold myself, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. I said, I, I know the market. Yeah. I, <laughs> I uh, live in the area, and, you know, I know the neighborhood and so forth. And he said, well, I don't really work with realtors. I, I've gotten my business. The guy owns um, about 13 homes in the area. And he said, um, you know, I pretty much got my business, you know, so much so that if I have a house become vacant, I'll reach out to my current tenants, and they'll always refer someone. I said, okay. So um, he said, but let me, um, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and go with you. Okay. And so he ended up going with me. He said, but I need you to do it at a discounted rate. Mm. And, um, of course, I, you know, talked to Torian about it, and I was like, should I do this, you know? He said, well, yeah, you should go ahead and do it at this discounted rate. And, I'm Andre, when I tell you, 
I'm so thankful that I went and went ahead and did this deal for this guy at this discounted rate. I've made so much money with this guy over <clears throat> the last over last year plus, um, just from taking that one deal at a lower rate. Um, at this point, again, the guy owns about 13 homes, so not only is he buying more homes, but he's sending other folks to me to buy homes, and they're all investors. And so basically what they're doing is they're coming in, they're buying up homes, so I'm the agent on you know, buying the homes, but then basically I make money three ways in a lot of cases because I'm helping them buy homes. I'm then putting um, a tenant in the home, okay. and then if I uh, secure the tenant myself, I'm become what's known as a dual agent. So I'm representing both the landlord and, and the tenant right. on top of just helping them buy the home. So that's three ways I didn't touch money in that one home. Okay. And so it's been a blessing. Um, it's been a blessing as a new agent. What I find is you work a lot with first time home buyers. Right. Um, it's been a blessing to put so many of them into homes. Um, you know, now my business is pretty much ran because I do, outside of being in the church and being a mom and a wife, I also, and a realtor, I also um, still work in HR now. So I don't have a ton of time um, to do all of our, I want to do in, in real estate. So my business pretty much is ran with a lot of investors at this point. Okay. But my early career was those first-time home buyers, and I, I do have a heart for uh, first-time home buyers because we all were there. Right. Um, the education is needed. I spend a lot of time with home buyers um, educating them. I think that is the key, being educated, <laughs> knowing that you don't have to stick with one bank. You can go and do your research contact different um, lenders and see who has the best offering for and best products for you. Um, so that, you know, I love it. I love real estate. Uh, I keep telling my husband every day, go ahead and retire me. And I, I mean that from a sense of coming from the corporate world right. and being able to strictly focus on not only on the church, but also um, in real estate. That, that, that's for my baby. And that's what I love. Absolutely. <clears throat> so, I want to publicly thank Jasmine Bridges Realty for being a sponsor for the Drawing Board Experience 2019. Well, thank you. No problem. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. And we look forward to partnering for Je Drawing Board 2020. <laughs> As a, we had a little off-camera uh, conversation, but um, I love the fact that you all, uh, as a family, you have a way of, those, of supporting those that are connected to you, uh, not just uh, donating financially, but showing up and inviting, I'll get a call from Torian and it says, or a text message, hey, hey, Doc, we're getting ready, uh, thinking about having dinner. You know, are you and the wife available this day, right? Uh, even so much so that we've, uh, I think we initially met on a Valentine's Day trip to Chicago. Chicago. Yes. We did, yeah. yeah. And so uh, this guy comes walking around. We're in, uh, I think, Nike Town. Or we're in somewhere, and this guy comes walking around with the book. And so I look like, who's this guy that might love books just as much as me? <laughs> and so he's like, hey, I'm Torian. And then he, you know how he's really casual at first. like, And then we got a chance to talk over dinner. And I'm like, oh, yeah, this is, uh, this is going to be a great relationship. You know, a love and a hunger for knowledge, passion for Christ, uh, very concerned about his community. Uh, will fight a brick for his family. Absolutely. And uh, I was like, this is my kind of guy. This, this, <laughs> he's all right with me, you know. And uh, through throughout the years, uh, we have seen God do some miraculous things. And uh, through Jasmine Bridges Realty, uh, now you all are embarking upon this huge endeavor uh, as pastor and first lady with Commonwealth of Faith Church, rooted in Christ and rooted, rooted in, in Redford. Redford. Yeah. Talk to me about it there, Bishop. Oh, no. I just, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> I believe that we're coming to the place now where millennials, which will outgrow any other segment, where we're starting to get married, starting to have kids, and the first thing we think about is we got to find ourselves somewhere to go to church. Okay. And we're not just talking about you know, just going to someone's church just for, I mean, we are looking for places to put in roots. Right. A lot of us grew up in the actual church. A lot of us strayed away from the church. But as we start to have kids and our kids begin to test us, what's the first place we think? We got to find these kids at church. Sunday, Sunday school. Sunday, church, Sunday, right. Sunday school. And, and um, 
two weeks after the house burned down, I remember we were in Chicago for a friend. She just bought a house or something. And my favorite Macy's in the entire world, Andre's been there with oh, me, my is goodness. the Macy's on State Street, which is the original Marshall Fields. Yes. I, that's my favorite place in the entire world world. That is my wife's favorite place as and, well. And, and so, yeah, yes. both both of us was there that we time, were. tearing it down. Yes, <laughs> I'm telling you, listen, let me take a minute. Shalisa Ebron, I gotta tell you, she kept me in that Macy's we was in there for about day. six or seven no, hours. No, no, you was at the one at Watertown. Okay, All And right. then that's when I told you, I said, that's the bad Macy's. Y'all need to come with us to the good Macy's. And that's where I got that suit. Remember I had that blue suit when we were at that Macy's. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't remember the suit, but you I don't do know. The suit. Yeah, but, but here's the thing: I do know that we had a great time, uh, and uh, there were some great deals. And so that there were some great deals. <laughs> That's a nice plug for Macy's. Yeah, Especially Macy's. The, Macy's. Listen, become a sponsor of the Drawing of the Board, drawing board <laughs> podcast. The, Go ahead. The, <laughs> it's the magic of Macy's. Right. So that um, Saturday during, uh, I think it was Vanessa's housewarming. I, I said, you know, Jasmine, we have to go to Macy's. And one of her friends said, they're going to go look at the windows. And I remember looking at her. What you mean I'm going to look at the windows? I'm from Detroit. I can go into any store and buy whatever I, I want to buy. Right. And I remember getting so pissed off. Like, how dare she insinuate we going to do <laughs> Window shopping. Right. <clears throat> Only to get to the Macy's and see all these people around these windows. Right. And what Macy's, that Macy's and the one in the, uh, the uh, original one still does is during the holidays, they have these amazing Christmas displays during the window. Right. What I've come to believe now is that there's a lot of churches that have amazing window spaces. Okay. But when you go inside of them, there's nothing for your actual families. There are no, there's no growth. I mean, you could have concert after concert and conference after conference, but if I'm not growing as a person, that's an issue for me. And when <laughs> it becomes more about services than it is about souls, People see that, and they see it happen real fast. And millennials are one of those people that you just can't feed us all of the stuff all the time. There's some stuff we got to, you know, there's a fine line in the actual sandwich. So um, that's how we became, you know, church actual planters, which is a movement to start brand new churches that were more community focused. And I mean community focused like I live in Redford, you know, this is our, our second home in Redford, and the church is in Redford. And it just so happens now we announced, what's today, Tuesday? We announced yesterday um, that we are moving into a former Catholic church space that was built in Redford. You know, and it's about us bringing the word back to that community. Right. <clears throat> I know you have a saying that you didn't just want to be another church in the community. We wanted to be the community's church. I mean, absolutely. I mean, and we say communities, you know, because there's multiple communities. We have members in Southfield, um, Northville. I think that's Northville or Novi, where John is at. But you know, Redford is home for us. I mean, but a lot of it is, and Redford's in a very transitional time. You know, Andre, you may not know that because you're not originally from here. You know. But uh, oh, listen, no shade yeah, there, right? There's yeah, no shade. I, I felt, I felt to, the, no shade. it got a little dark but, over there. But here, I when there. I was <laughs> when I was learning how to drive, one of the places that young black men avoided driving was in Redford. I think it's still like that. Well, I mean, it could, no, I mean, no, it could. <laughs> no, I mean, no, but, it's but, progressing. But but now the actual township I would say is about sixty, like forty. Right. No. You know, yes. with a lot of African, uh, say Americans move. There's a lot of like. Uh, there's a lot of transiency going on in Redford. Right. And there's no, I mean, there's even the opioid, uh, a couple Christmases ago, our neighbor's daughter overdosed mm. on Christmas Day. 
Man, I'm sorry to hear that. You know, because this, I mean, and now that I think about it, that was like the first start of you starting to hear this, you know, the opioid, opioid crisis. crisis. Mm-hmm. Right. That's creeping in to Redford, and nobody really knows how to deal with it. And it's one thing for you to have church service there. We used to, we, when we first opened the church, we were leasing the space from this guy who's a bishop, I guess. Um, that was shady. Now that was shade. Yeah, I, 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 have, I have no, I have no problem saying when I'm shit. That was shade. Okay. And he was more interested in having campuses than he was about that community. And I remember um, one of our dear friends got married, um, going to Saginaw for the wedding, coming back, and washing the walls of that church. In in the suit I was in that wedding in right, um, and Andre, there was just <clears throat> horrible. I mean, there was condoms in the church, there was maggots and say toilet cans. I mean, and you're talking about a place that was a functioning as a church, was actually functioning as a church, and he just wanted to collect rent and keep it moving. Didn't care about the community. And um, now we are sort of like done dealing with that jerk. So, you know, <laughs> God had a lot greater plans for us, you know, coming out of that. Right. But, you know, it's uh, we have a heart for Redford and Absolutely. those areas that are actually surrounding Redford. For <coughs> us, Redford is the major city in the area for us. And that's what our that's where our um, uh, our hearts are excellent so i know you have a campaign going on right now but before we um because we're getting ready to close uh or we'll have lady jazz close us uh give some inspiring words reflecting on the podcast that we've had today but the rooted in christ rooted in redford campaign where can people find more information about that at rooted in redford.org and rooted in redford.com okay and if they want to follow you on social media where can they find you lady jay well, my um, my business page, I have a couple. I believe it is Jasmine Bridges Realty <clears throat> on Instagram. And um, is, that, is that my page? I think so. Yes, Jasmine Bridges Realty. Okay, so Instagram. follow follow Lady J at Jasmine Bridges Realty on Instagram. And the Commonwealth of Faith Church at Commonwealth 313. Uh, on Instagram. And okay. Think, is it Commonwealth 313 on Facebook? It's Commonwealth of Faith. Commonwealth of Faith on Facebook. Okay, so please follow them. Uh, go now. Make sure uh, you have another business, too, where you print. Yes. Yeah, what is the name of that business? HB2 Designs. I got the, the name for my kids, both names beginning with H, Hannah and Hunter. So HB, last and, name, two, right. Designs. And I make custom shirts and blankets and so forth. Yetis and all that other good stuff. Okay, excellent, excellent. So, uh, Lady J, we've talked about God giving us beauty for ashes. What do you want to leave uh, with the people tonight as we get ready to close the podcast out? Um, I guess, and I posted about this the other day um, on my Instagram page, is God will restore your souls. I think the most important thing is you have to keep the faith. I remember, you know, after I was diagnosed with cancer, you know, I, I of course, you know, like naturally, I took a day or two to myself to process my own thoughts, um, to, you know, get upset. And, you know, I, I did all that. I had all the normal reactions, but I always, my faith never wavered. Right. And I think that that's that's the key. Um, you know, even when we went through the, the battle of infertility, every step, even when we lost the house, every step of the way, you know, as hard as those situations are, I always ran to the word. I went to, you know, when for infertility, for instance, I'm like, okay, what does the Bible teach us about this? Um, where can I find other stories like that? I think it's always important to run to the word, to keep the faith. And always, no matter, you know, no matter how long it takes, he will restore you. And I think that's the key. Um, 
That's that's really that's really really all I have. If, you know, if you don't mind, if we got a couple minutes, I'll share um, a quick story. I shared this this week. <clears throat> Well, we actually are getting ready to wrap, so that means the next time that you come on, Lady J, I know that you want to hear that story. Okay. Um, so this is what you've seen. The Bible clearly says, for we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimonies. It's proof positive that somebody can lose a house and then God restore a house. Somebody can go through a physical ailment such as cancer, a very aggressive cancer, ovarian cancer, and God as a healer can deliver them. Uh, they can get ready to um, try to develop their church plant in a church that was not conducive to uh, accommodate their greatness. So God moves them forward. And so now with the Rooted in Christ, Rooted in Redford, Commonwealth of Faith Church is going forth to, to not just be a church in the community, but to be the community's church. If you're looking for a home in Redford and Metro Detroit, uh, please look at Jasmine Bridges Realty on Instagram. And, of course, like I always share, this happens to be the Thanksgiving edition of the drawing board. So we are thankful for all that God has done. Thank you all for coming on the show. Uh, I look forward to, uh, you know, uh, Valentine's Day at your home. <laughs> and uh, as we move forward, remember that your future is not behind you. It is not before you. It is within you. And I'm Andre Ebron. God bless you and happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving.